Hi there, I'm Wendy McCallum, burnout and balance coach and wellness expert, and you're listening to Bite Size Balance, where everyday extraordinary women share their stories, expertise, and wisdom, all in the name of lifting each other up and creating a better life by design. Whether it's wellness, career, relationships, food, mindfulness, hormones, or parenting, we talk about all things women's balance. If your life looks great on paper, but it still feels like something's missing, you're in the right place. Welcome to Bite Size Balance. Hello, everybody. I am back with episode two of the Bite Size Balance podcast, and I'm really excited again today because I have another really wonderful, wonderful guest, and I think you're really going to enjoy and appreciate what um, Jen Sleep Huber has to say about the topic we're going to discuss today. So welcome, Jen. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. So Jen is actually in The Hague, which is exciting. She's my first international guest as well. (laughs) Um, Jen Salib Huber is a registered dietitian in Canada and also a naturopathic doctor. Um, And Jen um, practiced for years and years here in um, the HRM. She was at Pillars of Health in Dartmouth, um, but is currently um, on a little bit of a sojourn over to um, The Hague. And so she's coming to us from there. uh, I have done some programming with Jen in the past, so some of you will recognize Jen's name because I've shared I've shared lots of stuff that Jen has um, hosted, um, and also we ran a program called Menopause Matters, uh, which was a really successful program. We ran that for a couple of a couple of Is years that like together. Four years ago? Yeah, it was a long time ago. I know, um, but it was such a great program, and I had so much fun doing it. And Jen is actually the person who first um, you were really like my menopause teacher. Um, because I really didn't know anything about perimenopause um, before I met you. And um, in those conversations that we had just in the course of like brainstorming what this program might look like, I was bringing questions to you that I had been getting from my clients um, around what the heck was going on with them. Um, And you were answering them in a way that was just so clear and simple to me. And that is really the reason why I think I was you know, at a point where I was like, I want to do a program with Jen. Um, so we're not going to focus on perimenopause and menopause today. Instead, we're going to focus on this really kind of cool, I think, new way of thinking about food and eating for women, um, which is called intuitive eating. And Jen has a certification in intuitive eating and is really, really passionate um, about the idea of helping women build body confidence in their 30s, their 40s, and their 50s, um, and introducing them to uh, a, uh, a new way of looking at food. Um, and for those of you who've worked with me before, either in an online program or in a, in a one-on-one coaching relationship, you know that one of the things I'm really, really passionate about is helping people to achieve, women to achieve freedom from food. Um, and when I think of freedom from food, I think of not thinking about it all the time. It's just clearing that space in your brain in terms of not having it be something you're constantly thinking about. Like, what did I eat for my last meal? What am I going to eat for my next meal? Was my last meal good? Was my last meal bad? Do I deserve this thing? Have I earned it? You know, um, and this idea of, you know, is it time for a cheat day or a cheat meal yet? That's the kind of stuff that really, I think is, you know, it's really a prison for women. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is always to help women achieve freedom from food in terms of a long-term goal and to start framing their goals around food and how they eat from an abundance and freedom based perspective, as opposed to a deprivation based perspective, which is largely um, what, you know, the approach that we'll find in most commercial conventional weight loss programs out there. Um, and so by the time women get to me, they've usually tried it all, Jen. They've just, yep. they have been through the ringer um, and they are beat up and broken down as a result of that commercial weight loss system, which for everyone I have ever met, Jen, I don't know if you've met anyone who's been different on this, but everybody I have ever met has yo-yoed up in that yep. system. So their weight has just, you know, they may have had some weight, weight loss success. They probably have had significant weight loss success when you accumulate it all together. But what, what, what is the pattern for almost everybody that I work with is that they have, they have lost and then they have gained more than they lost and so on. And they've yo-yoed their way up. And yeah. so um, what I'm always encouraging women to do, whether it's in relation to food or some other habit, whether it's a mental habit or a physical behavior um, that they want to change is to really open themselves up to the idea of trying something different instead of just trying the same thing harder. And I, yeah, and I think that this conversation that we're about to have about intuitive eating is going to provide women with a really, um, really, really 
interesting and novel way of trying different. And so I'm really excited for this conversation. Yay, me too. So Jen, can you start by telling us a little bit about your story? How did you get to the intuitive eating um, focus? Like what, what got you there? It, it goes back a long ways. So when I, I think like most women our age, my age, mid forties, whatever, um, I was introduced to diet culture really early. And when I was 12, I remember very distinctly the day that I decided that I needed to go on a diet. Um, anybody who ordered clothes from the Sears catalog may remember the color neon and black blocked um, one piece and two piece bathing suits that everybody was wearing in like the mid to late 80s. Um, and I had ordered the two piece neon green and black color blocked bathing suit um, in the same size that I had worn the year before. And when it arrived, it didn't fit uh, because I had gone through puberty in that past year. And all of a sudden I had hips and I had breasts and I was softer and rounder. And, you know, no one really knew to tell girls at that age that that's normal, right? That happens. It's supposed to happen. It has to happen. Biologically, it needs to happen. So that was kind of my introduction to there's something wrong with my body and I need to change it. And so, you know, I went on my first diet and there were many after that. Um, and, you know, which led into an eating disorder and then, you know, in my later teens and disordered eating through most of my 20s and early 30s. I went into nutrition because I wanted to try and figure out how to fix myself, but instead I ended up surrounding myself with people who were equally obsessed. <laughs> and so right. you know, <laughs> it was like, all, you know, it, it was reinforcing that there was something wrong with me, right? And so, but what I wasn't realizing is that there was something wrong with the system. And so after, you know, kind of 10 or 15 years of practicing, um, I guess it was about 10 years of practice and I was in my mid thirties and I'd had three kids and all the things that were working, but not really working and weren't healthy and weren't sustainable, weren't working at all. Um, and, you know, I was at this kind of breaking point personally. Um, and I was starting to see so many women coming in feeling the same way, right? They were coming in and they're like, I don't understand. I did this five years ago and it worked and now it's not working. Um, and like you, I was never the first diet they were trying. I was the 10th, the 20th, the 30th. Um, you know, they were coming to me as an ND, desperate for me to tell them that there was something wrong with their thyroid or that there was some kind of, you know, that I was going to have the magical cure. And I don't even re exactly remember when or who or how, but this idea of intuitive eating was intru introduced to me about five years ago. And at first it sounded really crazy. And I was like, well, what do you mean intuitive eating? I have to know how many calories and how many macros and grams and when I last ate and how much I've exercised and how many calories were burned during that exercise. And, and that's what I had been teaching myself. And that's what I had been teaching people because that's what we've been taught to teach people, right? The conventional weight loss paradigm is calories in, calories out, end of story. Um, and so the idea that one, bodies can come in all shapes and sizes and be healthy, the idea that you can have, you know, everybody eating the same way and doing the same exercise and they're still not going to all lose the same amount of weight and their bodies are going to look differently. Um, and the idea that I could trust my body to know when to eat, what it wants, how much to eat, um, was really kind of rocked my world and, and at first in a really skeptical way. So I did some of the kind of earlier trainings and did some webinars to kind of figure out um, if this was going to click and it clicked, it clicked with me personally, it clicked with me professionally. Um, and probably about three and a half years ago now, I really kind of closed my practice to weight loss because I felt like it had become unethical to prescribe weight loss anymore um, or to support people in the sole goal of weight loss. So um, that's kind of how I got there. And, you know, it has really just grown so much. Like, you know, when I first started, telling people about intuitive eating and trying to get people on board. They were like, what? Intuitive what? What are you talking about? You know, the whole idea of intuitive eating, um, you know, body positivity, health at every size, like those were not words that were being used, right? And now in the last year to two years, it has just exploded, which I love, which is amazing. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, and I want to get into like what intuitive eating is, because I think most people who are listening to this podcast don't know what intuitive eating entails. Um, so I really, I want to get into the details of that. But when you were talking about this idea of, you know, really starting to close off your practice away and move away from this idea of weight loss for the sake of weight loss, 
I just 100% hear you on that. That resonates with me so much. That is, as you know, I think something that happened to me as well. I started off with all the best intentions. <laughs> and when I, when I first started coaching 10 years ago, I was coaching largely around food. Um, I published the cookbooks. People were coming to me for recipes and meal plans and support around food. Um, and it, it, like I honestly burnt out around weight loss after like year two because I was, I was just so frustrated with, I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't compete with the commercial weight loss industry and the mentality and the approach of that industry. And it did not sit right with me. I have never thought of it in terms of ethics before, but I appreciate that you just articulated it that way because I do feel like that was a piece of it for me. It just felt wrong. Um, and I tried my best to put together programs that would that would like an, an approach that would resonate with women um, and actually bring people in and hopefully start shifting their mindset around food and give them that freedom. But I honestly had, there was so much resistance to the fact that I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do meal planning. I wanted to teach people how to meal plan and how to organize their food. I, I didn't want to give them done for you plans. I didn't want to, you know, provide people with portion guidelines and things like that. I wanted people to eat until they felt satisfied. And I wanted the food to always taste delicious and all of these things. And there was so much resistance to it. So um, I want to talk to, um, and I just, I'm raising this now, so I don't forget to do it, but I want to talk about why you think women resist intuitive eating as well, because I think it's going to be the same reasons that people were resisting, you know, whatever my blend of approaches was that I was doing years ago. Um, and now when I work with women around food, food is almost the last thing we talk about, you know, mm -hmm. so my approach is, yeah, really and, and, and that's food why I, issue. sorry, say that again. Food is not the issue. No, right. it's not. And I mean, that's why I went back to, that's why I went back and did generalized coach training because I realized really quickly into it that it, this wasn't about women looking for support around what to eat, when to eat it, how to eat it, how to prepare it even. Um, these women, in fact, almost every woman who sits down on my couch in my office or who meets me on Zoom, um, who is looking to make some change around her, her mindset around food um, or behaviors around food, the first thing the person says is, I already know what, I already know what to eat. I just don't do it. It's, mm -hmm. almost, it's almost always the first thing that comes out of their lips. <clears throat> and I believe they believe that. You yeah. know, they've, they've spent their whole life. They're like experts <laughs> in- I used you know, to tell people that if, you know, achieving a healthy weight was just about knowing what to eat, I wouldn't have a job. Right. right. Because the yeah. internet will tell you what you want to hear. Right. Yeah. Which is have this, don't have this, have more of this, have less of this, you know, like it will really um, emphasize that calorie in calorie out equation. Yeah. And sometimes not even so subtly, you know, kind of insert that if you can't follow it, there's something wrong with you. Right. That it's right. your fault. You yeah. lack the willpower. You lack the discipline. You don't want it enough. You're doing the wrong thing. You're not working with the right person. Like, it all come back to being on you when in fact it's the dieting industry that's the problem yes right? yes yes you know, like 95 percent of diets fail after two years yeah i had never heard that statistic or the evidence supporting it until i started doing my intuitive eating training in 2015 or 2016 yeah. whatever um and i was like how can i have two degrees one of them specifically in nutrition um, and maintaining, you know, all of the licensing requirements for that and going to conferences and continuing ed and, you know, how could I have never heard that? Right. Yeah. Um, it's you know, 90, just, just, just so everybody hears that, I'm not sure that that was clear. So I just want to repeat it. 95% of diets fail. 95%. And they've done studies looking at kind of, is there any diet that's going to work more than another diet? Right. And all diets work for six months. And I say work in quotations. All diets work for six months. And then after six months, all diets start to fail. doesn't matter if it's low carb, whether it's vegan, whether it's low, whatever it is, you can sometimes sustain that change and that caloric restriction and whatever else it's going to take for three to six months. But you can't sustain it forever because that's not how we're wired to work. It is not how we are wired to nourish ourselves. Right. So yeah. especially Jen, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but I find especially if the only motivation, the only goal is weight loss for the sake of weight loss. Yep. So I have seen situations where people are able to maintain, you know, some routine, specific routine around food, whatever that might be, when they're motivated by 
a completely, you know, factors that are completely different from the scale. So for example, they've had a, they have developed an illness and they're trying to support their body through that. And they're trying to, you know, they're trying to actually nourish their body better. Um, or um, so occasionally sometimes, you know, people, anyway, there are all these different reasons why people lose weight, but the majority of the people that come to see me, weight loss is number one. It's like, it's like the actual number on the scale is always number one. And honestly, I think that that's the, probably the biggest factor in that 95% failure rate, yeah. to be honest. Um, yeah. And, and you know, the thing is too, is uh, to kind of to your point about, you yeah. know, if we focus on other things. So, um, you know, so much of the time women believe that weight loss has to be the metric of success, right? Um, but nutrition always has to come from a place of self-care and not self-control. So if you are choosing your foods to try and control your body, it is not going to work. If you are choosing foods to care for your body, which is falling under the umbrella of gentle nutrition, one of the principles of intuitive eating, you know, you are going to achieve success far beyond the scale. Um, you know, I use an example of kind of a fictional patient, um, but kind of is a mishmash of all the different types of, you know, things that I've seen, you know, of like the 50 year old nurse who um, is recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, works shift work, is a single parent, managing household work after school, doesn't have time for self-care, doesn't have time to cook, or doesn't prioritize, kind of, you know, isn't able to prioritize fitting in food regularly. So is eating kind of off schedule, doesn't have time for joyful movement. All of those other things contribute to the diabetes as well right but diet culture and the mainstream kind of medical model around diabetes is diet lifestyle first right so you've got to get that under control when in fact you know we know that sleep deprivation shift workers have you know metabolic disorders that are completely independent of what they're eating yeah. right so if we can acknowledge and start to address those other things then you know, yes, we're going to include food. Food matters, obviously, but food isn't the only thing that matters and it has to come from a place of self-care. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I wrote that down actually because I love that idea that nutrition needs to come from a place of self-love in, instead of self-control. That's such a great way to articulate it. Um, and when you were talking about diet and lifestyle not being the only factors, maybe one of another way to look at it is we need to really broaden that definition of lifestyle so that it actually means what it's supposed to mean. You know, when I'm talking about lifestyle with people, I'm talking about like all, I've got four pillars that I use, you know, these pillars of health, but the biggest one is mental health and, and, and mental health and stress management are not just about mental health and stress management. They're about all these other things. That's actually the biggest, most important pillar in my mind. And it's where I do most of the work with the people that I, that I work with. So I love that. Let's get into intuitive eating because okay, okay. now people are really curious. People are like, <laughs> what is this? You know, so tell us what kind of the basic principles of intuitive eating, what it is and how it works for women. Okay. Um, so the best way to kind of think of it is it's a framework to help you redefine your relationship with food and how food can fit into your life in helping you to achieve what matters to you in terms of health, right? So it's not a diet, it's not a set of rules, it's not a plan, and it really tries to dismantle the association between health and weight, and it also tries to dismantle and kind of uncouple all of the beliefs that we have around food. So one of the first principles is learning to ditch the diet mentality. And for so many people, this is unconscious. They don't even realize they're doing it, right? When they're choosing to have, you know, a burger without a bun, um, or when they're choosing to see if they can, you know, not have breakfast for the first couple of hours, or if they're choosing to see if they can fill up on a salad. Like sometimes those are intentional diety choices, but sometimes they're just really unconditional beliefs that, you know, that people have about food, you know, that carbs cause weight gain or that eating after 8 PM um, will cause weight gain. Like all of those aren't founded in science, right? But diet culture is so pervasive in getting us to believe that, that so many people just believe them to be true. So, right. And I think um, it's important to just, sorry to interrupt, but I think it's important that people understand the fact that the unconscious stuff really matters. Cause a lot of people are like, well, it doesn't really matter. It's in my unconscious, but you know, what's happening with all of those unconscious beliefs that we hold to be true, sometimes like as true as the sky is blue, like we really believe these things to be true. And 
when we have those things, what's happening is while our unconscious mind is something that it's, you know, it's really difficult for us to access, access it and know exactly what is down there, it is influencing all of the decisions that our rational brain mm -hmm. is making. Um, and it's often responsible for that, you know, that cognitive dissonance that we have between like what we know we want to do and what we actually do. Um, and so it, it's, it's hugely important. These underlying beliefs are hugely important. And I really, you know, if you're, if you're in the coaching world, like you and I are, it's what we do as coaches yeah. is we really, we really try to figure out what those are. Yeah. yeah, it's questioning everything about why you believe what you believe. Yeah. Um, and it takes a lot of dismantling and it sometimes takes a lot of convincing to get people to believe that they don't have to diet and that dieting doesn't work. So um, I won't go into the details too much, but there's the big, big loser or the biggest loser study, which came out in 2016, which was really kind of key in showing us that diets do harm in that they actually cause metabolic slowdown. Um, and that 12 of the 13 participants had regained all the weight and more at five years, um, you know, and that their, their metabolism was now kind of 500 calories a day slower than it was before. And so they were now hungry all the time because their hunger and fullness hormones were all messed up. They had to eat less just not to gain more weight, oh. um, you know, and so I think that that was kind of a bit of a turning point in the professional nutritional world. Like, okay, we actually really need to look at why diets aren't working because maybe it has nothing to do with the people and has everything to do with diets, right? 100%, um, so yeah. The first is about kind of, so ditching that diet mentality. Um, everyone, or p even people who maybe have heard a little bit about intuitive eating, think about it as like the hunger and fullness way of eating, right? Um, and that's a huge part of it. But I often tell people like, Learning to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full needs to be your end point uh, in your work with me or with anyone else, right? It's part of the work, but it's not kind of where you start because in order to know where to start, you have to understand why you eat, where you eat, what are your emotional hunger cues, what are your physical hunger cues, um, you know, what kinds of foods do you enjoy? What do you not enjoy? What are your obstacles and barriers? Like there's so much that we need to understand about your relationship with food that may go back to your childhood, right? You know, I've had people tell me that, um, you know, that their parents hid food in a locked cupboard, um, you know, and for them, it just elevated those foods so much that it was such an unconscious belief that they can't control themselves around that food right? Because their parents locked it away. They truly believe that that food is addictive, that it has control over them and they can't be around it. Yeah. Um, and it clouds all of their decision making. Right? Oh, and there's so much scarcity too in that mindset. Like so much. I can't get it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so kind of understanding hunger and fullness cues, um, making peace with food. So like the example of food that's locked up in the cupboard or, you know, chips, Chips are a big one. People will often say, oh, yeah, you can tell me I can have whatever I want, but I'll never be able to have chips. Like if I have one handful, that's it. I'm done. The bag is gone. And, you know, I'm like, that's a food you need to pay, make peace with because that is an unconscious belief that we need to dismantle. There, you are not magnetically attracted to the chips, right? Like it is not a parasite that is causing you to eat more. Um, it is the fear that you have around how you feel about that food. And, you know, so all of that kind of work comes first. Um, and once we kind of do all that work and we've made peace with food and we no longer believe that diets are the path to health um, and we start to really understand kind of our hunger and fullness cues, then we start to add things in like gentle nutrition, right? Because of course food matters, right? No, I'm the last person in the world who's going to say that food doesn't matter, but it probably doesn't matter as much as we've been led to believe. So you can take it off of, you know, the top of the pyramid as being the most important thing. It's part of the pillars, like you say, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, so if we're looking at how do we introduce food from a place of self-care, um, it has to be with freedom and flexibility. So, you know, if you enjoy chips, there's nothing short of like, you know, a brain tra transplant that is going to get you to believe that you don't like them anymore, but you can have them. Um, as part of a pleasurable and enjoyable food eating experience without them having to take the center stage, right? And you can want to have salads or you can want to have more vegetables or you can want to have more fiber for reasons other than weight loss that will make it feel good instead of feeling like it's coming from a place of deprivation. Um, and then, you know, the other two pieces of it are joyful movement. So instead of looking at exercise as a means to an end, 
instead of looking at exercise always from a caloric deficit, like a tool to help you get in that caloric deficit, it's about what are all the other amazing things that moving your body every day can do for you, right? And that you can get just as much benefit from a walk on the beach, if that's what you feel like doing, than you can a spin class, right? Um, and when you start to pay attention to how those movements um, make you feel, you realize that you crave different things at different times, right? So I describe it to people like I, you know, I portion out a time of, out of my day, five days a week to do some kind of movement, but I have no idea what I'm going to do until the morning of, except for my Friday strength class. Um, you know, cause I wake up and I'm like, Oh, what do I feel like doing today? Oh, it's a nice day. I'm going to go for a run. Oh, I'm not feeling it today. I'm just going to do some stretching. Like it's very intuitive that way. And so that I'm always getting the best out of my movement, right? I'm not forcing myself to do a spin class. Um, if my knee is hurting, uh, you know, like it's being able to tune into that. Um, but I think the piece that resonated with me the most personally was that so much of our body size and shape is genetic. And that's another piece that diet culture does not like to tell us, right? Because it wants us to believe, and the commercial weight loss industry wants us to believe, that if we try hard enough, if we eat the right foods or, and not have the wrong foods, and if we do this and do that, that we can achieve this body shape, this ideal that has been glorified. Um, when in fact, there are some genetic body shapes, and mine is one of them, that will never look like that, right? Um, and, you know, but we don't tell people that that's okay. We don't tell people that it's okay that you have hips, that genetically that's how you're programmed. Yeah. Um, you know, we tell people it's okay to have different shoe sizes and different hair colors and different eye colors. We're not telling people with a size 10 shoe to shrink it into a six. Um, but yet we're telling people to make their bodies smaller, you know? So, yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Jen, I don't know. Are you comfortable sharing the example you gave, um, last time we chatted about the genetic Oh yeah, but my yeah. sister. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I found out a couple of years ago um, that I have this big bonus family that's part of a donor-conceived family, and um, and so one of there's a lot of genetic similarities between us, but one of them is a sister who's here in the Netherlands with me um, that is very very similar physically, um, you know, to the point where our kids have sometimes gotten us confused, um, you know, from behind. Um, you know, from the side, like we're just so similar physically that, you know, I remember the first time that, you know, my husband saw her, he was like, this is weird. Um, you know, and so, yes, of course there's differences, but, you know, for me to see those genetics mirrored back to me, knowing that we grew up in completely different environments, completely different houses, completely different lives. Um, and yet our bodies are still so similar. Like we can, we can shop for each other. Like she was at a yeah. store the other day and she's like, Hey, that dress that I have that, you know, that you like is on sale. Want me to grab it? Sure. And I know it's going to fit. Like that's a crate. That's to me, that's a crazy experience, right? Yeah. I, um, I have the same thing with my sister. I was telling you that she's taller than me, but our bodies are very, very similar. And my mom's body is very, very similar to ours. And now I see the same thing in my daughter, which is kind of cool. I got a question for you if you're comfortable yeah. asking, answering it. I'm just curious. Um, do you see, so if your sister and you have similar body types, do you feel yeah. like the way you see her body is different from the way you see your body? Absolutely. And it was yeah. a big part of my journey. Yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, it was a really, really, it was, um, it was a big part of my self-acceptance was recognizing like, and her body's amazing. Like they have biked around the world, like pedal biked, around the world. Like they just finished a 660 kilometer two week trip with their kids through the Netherlands and their kids are like eight and five. Like her body's amazing, <laughs> you know? Um, and so realizing that um, it was just another reinforcement to me that all bodies are good bodies and you can achieve health at every size and that you don't have to make what your body looks like on the outside your goal. You know, right. you can see what you're looking for, which is health and happiness and self-love and self-acceptance and, um, you know, being able to move through life with confidence and who you are inside and outside without making it small. So what's the biggest, because when I listen to that, I, I'm trying to put myself in, in some of my clients' shoes around mm -hmm. this. And also to be perfectly honest, like my brain is my client's brain around a lot of this stuff because uh, all of the stories, you know, the story that you were telling at the beginning resonates with me. I've had my own, my own disordered eating patterns, certainly over the years and disordered way of thinking about food over the years. And so it, it 
resonates with me and I know it's going to resonate with the people who are listening, the women who are listening to this podcast. But um, so I'm putting myself in their shoes and thinking of the questions that they would be asking right now. And one of the questions they're asking is like, uh, how do I, how do I get to a place where I love myself and accept myself at the weight that I'm at right now, which mm -hmm. feels very, you know, this is how they would describe it to me. It feels like an unhealthy weight. It feels like a risky weight. Um, so they've been told medically, maybe it's a risky weight. Yep. Um, it definitely does not, in their mind anyway, conform to the standard, this kind of you know, conventional, ridiculous, distorted um, standard of beauty. Um, and so what would, you, what would you say to that? Yeah, it, that's definitely, um, it's hard. And I tell people that you can start your journey to becoming an intuitive eater and to self-acceptance without loving your body. Like self, like body love and self-love is not a prerequisite to it, right? Um, that you can practice body kindness. That's a really good one to start with, right? So by saying that, yes, maybe my body can't do the things that I want it to do, but look at all the things it can do. Um, to start to see yourself through kind eyes, right? So instead of making every trip past a mirror or a reflection about being self-critical, you know, like, you know, the body checking behaviors, which are so common for women, women with and without eating disorders, automatic walk by a window walk by a reflection turn to the side see how you're looking and it's always through the lens of being self-critical right it's never looking in a mirror saying i want to look at myself see how awesome i look right it's always oh i want to see if this shirt is you know pulling or tugging in one spot is it too tight is it whatever so changing the language around how you see yourself even if it's a fake it till you make it yeah. right even if you have to like i sometimes will get women to put sticky notes on their mirror, um, reminding themselves of all the things they want to love about their body. Like women will say, I have amazing eyes. Everyone always tells me that, but I never see that because I'm never looking for that, right? So start by looking at your eyes. Start by looking at the parts of you that you do love. And it's a little bit harder when the medical piece comes in. So when people have been told that they're in a risk category, um, oftentimes that's based on the good old BMI, which is, you know, completely outdated and invalid when it comes to measuring health. Um, and so, you know, I tell people, let's, let's examine the facts that you've been given and see if they're actually facts, right? Um, and so sometimes we can do a little bit of unpacking and dismantling there. Um, and, you know, the health at every size kind of philosophy and paradigm is really good at providing people with a bit more framework and information on that. So kind of what do we actually know about health and body size? So, so much of the research that's been done, um, you know, research is really difficult when it comes to nutrition and when it comes to establishing causation and not just correlation so so many of the things that we believe to be true about health and weight are based on correlation they're not cause and effect right and we see people all the time who are living in larger bodies who are really healthful healthy and living long lives right um, so just because you're in a larger body doesn't mean that you're going to die of something sooner because people who are sm in smaller bodies also get diabetes right i, I use this famous example Early on, that was kind of a light bulb moment for me where I had two patients who had just both been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, one lived in a smaller body and one lived in a larger body. The one who lived in a larger body was referred to me for diet lifestyle counseling. She was given kind of a six month time period and then otherwise she was going to have to get on medication. Um, and, you know, her, her diet lifestyle was already pretty good, I think, by almost anyone's standards. The person who was living in a smaller body, um, was immediately put on medication because they said, well, it's clearly not diet lifestyle for you. When in fact, she had terrible eating habits by anyone's standards, right? So that bias exists in medicine and we're starting to see so much more of that emerge that people are being misdiagnosed and properly diagnosed, not getting access to the proper treatment because that bias is there, right? The weight bias in medicine that, oh, if a person lives in a larger body, kind of doesn't matter what their problem is, let's try and change that first. So there's definitely a big push in the health at every size world to say, let's, let's ask for evidence on things. Um, and let's really pr provide people with, um, you know, things that they can do. Because for many people, even if weight loss is a solution, even if in some magical world, losing weight cured condition XYZ, if it's unsustainable, is it still the right treatment? Right? Yeah. 
Yes. You know, like, yes. If Hallelujah. 95, if it's going to fail 95% of the time, would we do surgery that was going to fail 95% of the time? Would we prescribe a medication that failed that often? No, of course we wouldn't. We would find another way. And that's really what I think those of us um, in this realm are pushing for. Like, let's yeah. stop blaming everything on weight. Yeah. And let's start actually paying attention, measuring and valuing the toll that this takes on women's psyches, not yeah. just on their physical bodies. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I've said this to you, Jen, before, like the, I think the commercial conventional weight loss system is just flipping brilliant in terms of how it is set up to create this lifelong customer with this whole bait and switch thing. Let me just give you what you need right now, which is weight loss. If you follow this extreme program, it will work. And you know what? My guess is, is that it does, it works statistically to create that. I don't know what the statistics are around the like immediate weight loss of the diet industry. Um, it, it's more than, it's definitely less than the 95% success rate. Like it's a, or the opposite, you know what I mean? It's a, it's, it has, it, it has a good success rate in terms of short-term weight loss, a lot of these programs. And that is the problem because it hooks you into the system, which then of course is not maintainable or sustainable for women, which causes women to, to, you know, I'm putting this in air quotes. If you're listening to this podcast, fall off the wagon, which are terms that I hate. Um, but it causes them to, um, you know, they can't make, they can't maintain it. Life gets lifey. Something, something happens. They can't keep okay. doing this thing. And as a result of that, they feel like a complete failure, which then of course leads to them beating the crap out of themselves, which has this massive psychological toll, which then leads to usually behaviors that stem from that, whatever the emotions are that come up with all of that, which causes that weight regain, um, and more gain even more gain, which causes them to eventually get to a point where they're so desperate that they look for the next quick fix solution. And so they just, this industry is set up to create a lifelong customer and it's absolutely brilliant um, from a marketing perspective. But one thing I like to remind women of, I just want to interject with the story, Jen, that I told you when we were talking in our kind of our pre-interview that I just think is fascinating and I want to make sure that I got it out today. So I have a client who's given me permission to share this story today. Um, for whom, um, you know, she's trying to make some changes around her mindset with food and how she eats. And it's really important to her to get to a place where she feels like she has freedom from food, um, but also balance in terms of her wellness, which she recognizes isn't there right now. And we were talking about this kind of, you and I were just talking about these un, these unconscious beliefs that we have, these things that are just so rooted in our unconscious and we believe them to be so, so true. And one of her beliefs that we kind of, that we came across in the course of coaching is that, um, she is very resistant to the idea of making her own food. Um, and it's because she is a highly successful woman, as, woman, as, as my clients all are. Um, and she has achieved so much in her life and she is a staunch feminist. Um, and she really felt like being in her kitchen was just reinforcing a patriarchal construct. And she truly believed this. So, and, and I understood it. She was like, I, don't, I can't, like there's something that just feels wrong about having to be in my kitchen, you know, as a yeah. woman. And I, I'm resisting that. I don't want to be there. It feels very, it just doesn't feel good to me to be there. And so we, you know, did the work through coaching that we do around, uh, you know, reframing that belief and trying to come up with, you know, something that serves her better because that was such a limiting place for her to be looking at food from, right? Like I can't, I don't, I can't prepare my own food. And you know, just as well as I know that at the first step to nourishing your body properly is to take back control over your food and start making it yourself, make more of it yourself, get involved in your food, actually put some love into the creation of food, make it pleasure, make that process pleasurable. It's impossible for food prep to be pleasurable when you're, you're in there and all you can think is, here I am barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen again, right? So <laughs> she, she, we, we went through this, this, the process of kind of dismantling it, which was really fascinating to me. And in the course of that, as we were gathering the evidence for why this is really not true, you know, why this, this belief that she has is not true, one of the things that we realized is that this commercial conventional weight loss system, which is what she's reaching for over and over and over again, along with the commercial fast food industry, which is where she goes to get the food so she doesn't have to conform to the patriarchal stereotype, is in itself the patriarchy. You know, it's, it's <laughs> the people who are making money from both of those systems are largely men. Right. And so um, anyway, when we got to that point, this light bulb kind of went on in her head and it kind of it, it shifted the way she was thinking about it. But I think that's a great example of just, you know, we have these beliefs that are so, so true to us around food and they're 
there's such a variety in what they are. A lot of them stem, you know, they come down to a very similar underlying belief. Um, but the way they manifest is just so fascinating to me. Um, but the point of this is that taking the time to actually figure out what some of those are and then taking the time to dismantle them, as you say, can be incredibly empowering for women. And now, Absolutely. now this client's mantra is she came up with this herself instead of, you know, being in the kitchen is disempowering and just, you know, me conforming to the patriarchy. Her new kind of mantra is I stand in power in my kitchen. Oh, I love that. It's cool, right? Like she, that's where she got to. And I did not get her there. She got herself there, which is really, really cool. And that's one of the amazing things about coaching is that people are, you know, they have yeah. this, they know this already. It's down there somewhere. It's just gotten, it's gotten clouded by all of the stories that they have been told and the things that have filtered into their unconscious mind over the years around something as big as food. Because God knows we've been fed, <laughs> no pun intended, well, pun intended, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> We have been fed so much misinformation around food and health and what it means to nourish yourself. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, one of the thing, there's definitely a lot of kind of patriarchal connections to diet culture and the thin ideal. And um, I, I don't, I can't remember who said it, but it wasn't me initially, but you know, that it's an act of, of subversion um, to step out of diet culture. Yes. Right. Um, and it's so empowering. So isn't, that, isn't that great, you guys, if you're listening to this? Jen said that to me in the pre-interview, and I forgot. But I loved that. <laughs> I, I just love that. It just feels so good to yeah. be engaging consciously in an act of subversion to the patriarchy. And then honestly, Jen, that is not something I would have said 10 years ago, but I feel like I turned 45 and everything shifted for me. Yeah. And now I am very comfortable saying that, like, let's get subversive around this industry because it is such a terrible terrible cycle for women to be caught in and it is it it can be so different and that's why I wanted to have you on here there is a way to do this differently instead of doing the same thing like trying the same thing over and over just harder like oh, I'll just do I'm just going to do this again I'm just going to do it harder try something mm -hmm. different try something different because we know and you know if you're listening to this and this is resonating with you whatever you have been doing is not the solution it is not working for you. It is time to open up your mind, make some space, get curious, and actually look at an alternative way to approach this thing. And just, just try to cultivate just a tiny seed of hope that it might actually be the thing that gets you where you want to be with food. Yeah, you've exactly. Got to open the door up. You've got to open that door up. Yeah. Right, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, just along those lines that, you know, and if we can get people and some, I love when I see the light bulb go off. I love when I see the click, when I can get people to see their life with all the things that they think they will achieve with weight loss, right? When I can get them to see that they can have that regardless of whether or not the scale changes. Um, yeah, it's like ding, 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 ding. Like you just see their mind open up, right? right. You know, they're like, what? I can be healthy even if I don't lose weight, I can like my body, I can wear a bikini, I can do all these things, I can be happy in my relationship, I can get the promotion at work. Yes, all of those things have nothing to do with your weight, right? Yeah. But that desire to get to that place that we think we need to get to holds us back, right? We believe that it is the gate we need to get through, when in fact, it's the barrier, it's the wall that we need to knock down. So yeah. that's yeah. such a great way of articulating that. It's so true. It's so true. We're just looking at the whole thing ass backwards, as my mom would yeah. say. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's just upside down. Um, and so I really, I really love that. I got to ask you this, Jen, yeah. um, because this is a battle I fight on the regular with my one-on-one -on -one clients, not fight, but it's a conversation that we have. Um, and I understand why we're having it. So I'm not trying to, you know, make fun yeah. of it, but I constantly get pulls, but you know, my clients feel themselves pulled towards the next thing. So they'll come back to me and they'll say like, I just, I, I feel like I need to do that intermittent fasting thing. I feel like, you know, my friend is, you know, my friend has like been on keto now for six months and they're down 75 pounds or whatever it is. Um, you know, I feel like I've got to do that. I feel like that's where I need to go. And so, you know, I do all the work that I do around that, but I'm just curious as a nutritionist, 
registered mm -hmm. dietitian, um, as an expert around intuitive eating, and as a naturopath. What are your thoughts around programs like intermittent fasting, which is all the rage now, and keto? So many thoughts. We might need a whole separate show. <laughs> we can have a separate chat on this. I, I feel like try, I'll try and package it. Okay. So the first is if, if diets worked, um, they would work the first time and none of them ever do. That is why keto has come back as Atkins, as South Beach, as Ke whatever it is, like it, you know, it just repackages itself every few years. Of all the diets, and I'm sure you've seen this too, it is the least sustainable. It is the one that people get really excited about bacon for about three days. Um, <laughs> and then after that, they're like, oh, look at that apple. Oh, that would be so good. So they start to crave the things that their other diet said what they could eat. And then they just get all confused. So, um, but the biggest thing for me about keto is that, you know, ketones, Yes, we can survive on them, but there are bodies like break in case of emergency fuel system, right? Um, they are not designed for optimum efficiency, right? It's like putting the wrong kind of gas in your car. Yeah, the car may run and you'll get to where you're going, but at the end of the day, you're not going to get there as fast, you know, meaning energy wise. Right. Um, and, you know, it requires so much thought and planning that when people, um, even people who have success with keto, um, there's a, I, I think anyway, from what I see, there's so much of a mental struggle with it. Um, you know, like it's the always taking your own food to a party. Um, it's, you know, having like dried cheese in your purse at all times. It's eating copious amounts of, you know, smoked meat. And, and so there's so, it's so limiting that I just can't ever imagine a joy filled life on keto. And I don't, I don't know, maybe it's just the people that I've seen. I don't think I've ever seen anyone like achieve long-term health and happiness with keto. It's always a short-term thing. And they're, they think that once they arrive to where they want to be, that they can just stop keto and go back to how they actually think they want to eat and maintain the weight loss. Right. It so it's just another example of what we were talking about with that yo-yoing up, right? Because there's no there's no sustainable. And in order for something to be sustainable, Jen, I know you're going to agree with me on this. It has to be pleasurable. It has to be. If it does not, if it is not pleasurable for you and it does not bring you some joy and make you feel amazing, yeah. it's not sustainable. And so my experience is exactly the same as yours, by the way. I mean, I see people in here all the time who, for whom um, keto you know, has become the, their holy grail. Um, but when I say to them, <laughs> so how is that working for you? Um, they'll, Cause they'll say, oh no, no, it works, it works, it works. And I'll say, okay, tell me how it works. Like, give me the evidence for that. And they'll say, well, I did it for six months and I lost X amount of pounds. And I'll say, okay, great. And now, mm -hmm. how's it working for you now? Well, now I'm up X plus Y. Um, so how is, that, um, how is that in any way the definition of success with that. And it just leads you, it just puts you right, right back in. In fact, I think it's almost the most damaging thing when it comes to the mental, the mental side of it is that. Yeah. I, I have seen, um, I think close to a dozen people relapse into like inpatient eating disorders. Yeah. Um, I have seen people like I've had people come to me saying like, Oh, I've been put on antidepressants and sleeping pills and I've lost my period. So now I'm on the pill. Um, but, you know, they feel like that's okay because they've lost weight on keto. When I tell them like, hmm, all of those problems will probably go away if you just start eating real food again and start eating carbohydrates and, you know, and yeah. it's just like, oh, really? You know, like hair loss, um, you know, really like losing their periods for long periods of time, um, skin changes, you know, and for every one story of the person, you know, who I've never actually met. It's always like the friend of a friend of a friend who has achieved like all the health and love and success that they ever wanted to by eating keto. Um, I think that there's thousands more who are just really um, not thriving. And, and this isn't to say that I'm extremely compassionate to people's desire to lose weight. I am not trying to make fun of that or put that down at all. Um, but I'll make fun of keto all day long. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you too. I should clarify that as well. I think that, you know, I, I absolutely take when someone comes to me and this is one of their goals, I do not dismiss that at all. Yeah. Um, and so on that note, 
I want to ask this question. What's the connection between intuitive eating and weight loss for women? So if women have healthy weight loss as a goal, true healthy weight loss, but they also have the goal of freedom from food, are both of those things possible with intuitive eating? So in intuitive eating, um, I always tell people intuitive eating is not anti-weight loss, right? So that's a big misconception. Um, it, what it is, is anti, like it's against using weight as a proxy for health. Yeah. So if you are trying to lose weight because you think you need to in order to achieve health, that is not compatible with intuitive eating, right? Um, so I always tell people like, I would love for you to put your scale away while we're doing this or forever. I would love for you to stop thinking about weight, numbers, clothing size, all those kinds of things, and believe that you can get to your best weight and size, which is the one that you can get to without having to micromanage every aspect of your relationship with food mm -hmm. and be okay at that place, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we all have a set range. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the prevailing theory right now is that there's a range that our body is comfortable moving within. Um, you know, people used to joke that they had a winter weight and a summer weight. Well, that's probably that set range, right? Um, and that we don't have to micromanage that, that if we're listening to our body's needs and meeting those needs, that our body will happily settle there. And that's typically what I see. But, you know, in the journey to get to there and where you end up, there's no way to predict that. Some people lose weight, some people gain weight, some people stay the same. Right. right. Um, you know, what we're learning is that one of maybe the unfortunate consequences of a lifetime of yo-yo dieting is what's called metabolic adaptation. Right. Meaning that your body um, holds on to things a little bit harder and given the opportunity to store a little extra, it may still want to do that. So that that kind of came out of the Biggest Loser study that some people may actually have metabolic adaptation. Um, and so for some people, it's just, a, you know, about getting to that place in the here and now where their body it, shape and size is stable and healthy at wh in whatever size that is. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, so it's a difficult one to answer. Yeah, no, I hear you on that. And I knew that was going to be a hard question for you, but I wanted to ask it because I know people are thinking it when they're listening. Um, and I think that, you know, as you know, just sitting in my chair and doing what I do and the work that I do, my answer to that question would be, let's actually start valuing what comes from, the freedom from food. Like what does freedom from food actually look like? Let's place the value that is deserved on what is open and available to women when they are no longer consumed by what they just ate or what they are going to eat. Like what is available and open to you when that mental space gets freed up? And we start focusing on that and really working through the value of that and what that looks like for women and what their lives might look like if that was their reality. Um, I think that the the, the, the value of the weight loss as a goal or a measurement of success is going to shift correspondingly with that downward, obviously. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and I mean, I definitely see, um, it's always nice when people kind of see the other benefits. So one, I remember early on in my kind of intuitive eating coaching days, um, someone sent me this email and she's like, oh my goodness, this is such a hilarious side effect that I was not expecting. Uh, she said, but I'm wasting so much less food because now when I'm hungry, I just go to the fridge and open it and eat. I'm no longer thinking I can get this many grams of protein in this and this many grams of carbs in this. And this. Like she said, she was throwing out all kinds of food before, right? Which was taking up space in her head. Yeah, right yeah. guilt around that and constantly thinking about whether she had the right kind of protein or the right kind of starch now she just eats yeah right i love that i love that that's, I, that's a great that. it's like life changing yeah. Right? yeah it is and so many things like that happen i hear them all the time i mean the first thing that i always see and this usually is like uh you know it's a couple of months into people starting to shift their the way they're thinking about things it's starting to really think about nourishing their body and tending to their bodies you know in the in the words of i think we were talking about this before the podcast started jesse harold who's going to be a guest on the podcast coming up she talks about self-care as attending taking care of yourself tending tending well, which, which i i love i love that i'm going to start using that thank you jesse um but um you know when they start when when my clients really start tending themselves and they start really working on shifting their mindset around this and dealing with some of those unconscious beliefs that they have around food the, the thing that I see, and it's interesting, it's the same thing I see with my alcohol coaching clients when they, when they start to really achieve some freedom from alcohol, is this just this incredible glow, mm -hmm. just this incredible like vitality, um, which is, I think, you know, it's partly that they are 
you know, maybe focusing on their, so their food maybe has, has become more nourishing. So there's a piece of actual, you know, nourishment in it. But I think it's more the nourishment of your soul. It's the tending of that other, your other half, you know, the other piece of you that is just as important as the physical environment that you live in, the physical body that you live in. And so I, I love that. Thank you so much, Jen. This has been so amazing. I really want, I hope that you will come back and we can talk again because there are so many more things we could talk about just about this topic, but I think there are other things that you and I could talk about that would be really interesting to people. Um, there are a couple of things that I just want to ask you before we wrap up here. I want to know what your, um, a couple of things. So if somebody is thinking about, I'd like to try this, how do I start? Can you give them kind of like three bite-sized little um, tips for getting started? Okay, so one is a little bit of a mindset that bodies are meant to change, right? So you are not destined to have the same body size and shape throughout your whole life. So sometimes even just telling people that gives them permission to start thinking about that they can have health at every size, right? Yep. Um, so kind of that's one. It's just a little bit of a mindset shift that maybe you don't have to fit into your wedding dress to be healthy right? Um, that you can move on from that. Your wedding dress can be done and done and done. Um, but if you do, that's okay too. Um, one is starting to think about your beliefs around food. So if you believe that you have to eat a certain way, um, maybe just start to challenge that. Maybe just start to say, why do I believe this? Is it because this is what I've seen in my family? Is it because somebody told me this? Um, you know, do I have false evidence that it worked in the past like why do i actually believe that i have to have no carbs in my life in order to lose weight um and just starting to see that your body is talking to you all the time it is always telling you what it needs um and but it's up to you to choose how you respond right yeah. so when it's hungry it wants food and the only thing it wants is food um, you know, if you're, if your belly's rumbling and you're feeling, you know, sweaty and, you know, you're, you've got that whole hypoglycemia thing going on, like meditation's not the answer there. For the right? love of God, eat some food. I know. Yeah, yeah uh, that's great. Those would be kind of three things. Yeah. I believe you can be healthy at every size because all bodies are good bodies and your body is meant to change. Um, start to question your beliefs around food and know that your body is always talking to you and that you can learn to listen. That's so great. Thanks, Jen. So listen, people are going to want to know where to get in touch with you, where to find you. I know you're on Instagram and you're the menopause.nutritionist. Have I got that right? Menopause.nutritionist on Instagram. Where else can people find you? Um, so they can also find me at my website, um, which maybe you can have the show notes at jensalivehuber.ca. Sure. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, I'm kind of overseas for the next couple of years, um, but I'm still working primarily with people from Canada for one-on-one -on -one work, especially in Atlantic Canada. Um, but I also have a couple of programs that um, people can kind of access anywhere. One is the Thinking Woman's Guide to Menopause, which weaves intuitive eating into everything. So a lot of the stuff that you were talking about with uh, Sarah, Dr. Bailey last week, um, kind of my spin on that is to weave intuitive eating into it and have a whole module on just intuitive eating. Um, so that's available anytime. And then in January, I'll be relaunching my Find Your Way, which is a four week intuitive eating only uh, program, group, small group program. So um, if people are following me on Instagram, um, that's probably the best place, um, but also to sign up for my newsletter where you'll get some kind of first dibs, early bird info when uh, that program comes out in January. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Jen's programs are amazing, guys. Um, and thank you again, Jen. It's just been such a great conversation. And I know that what we talked about today is going to resonate with so many of the women who are listening to this podcast. Thank you for having me. I always love when we chat. I feel like we could have like a whole day long coffee chat. <laughs> my biggest struggle with this podcast is going to be cutting it off. I hate cutting people off. I could keep talking to you forever, but I am going to, to press pause on the record now. Stop on the record button. Um, and, um, and hopefully we'll have you back again sometime, Jen. You've been listening to Bite Size Balance with your host, Wendy McCallum. As a burnout and balance coach, I help busy high achievers like you create a more balanced, joyful life. To be sure you don't miss any upcoming Bite Size Conversations, subscribe now to this podcast. For more balance and wellness tips or to connect with me, visit my website at wendymccallum.com. That's W-E-N-D-Y-M-C-C-A-L-L-U-M.com.